they began to collectivize their farms like it had been done in the Soviet Union now. A collective farm. A collective farm is a farm land where nobody owns, so it's owned by the community. Where the people in the community would get up in the morning and all of them go to the field and work the farm. And then when the harvest time comes, they all share in the produce. Some of their harvest, of course, will go to the government's taxes, and the rest of it is equally divided. Essentially, it's communism, pure and simple, where that everybody works. And when the, uh, when the produce is over, they divide everything evenly. And here's what's bad about it. The ones who worked really, really hard get no more than the ones who loafed off and shirked. And the incentive you have is to shirk all you can and hope somebody else will do the work. But um, nevertheless, they, um, they farmed their, uh, their communes. Um, the communes were a disaster, as your book says. Bad weather happened to come along. I mean, don't ask me why bad weather would hit right at the time they started the communes. The peasants did not like it. Among other things, your book says it attempted to eliminate work incentives, destroy the traditional family unit, drive food production way down, and your book says as many as 15 million people may have died. Now, other books you read will say 25 million will die altogether, 15 million here and millions of people otherwise. Um, Mayo was very highly criticized. Well, Mayo Zedong responded by getting together a bunch of young people called the Red Guard. Now, I personally have a little bit of interest in the Red Guard because in 1966, again, I keep referring, we had to subscribe to U.S. News or Report. They had some few issues devoted to the Red Guard. The Red Guard was made up of people my age, essentially. China was taken over in 1949, uh, the year I was born. If I had been born in China instead of the United States, by 1965 or 66, I'd have probably joined the Red Guard. In other words, the Red Guard was young people in their basically late in their high school years. They carried around a little red book which was written by Mayo and it almost like the Bible where that Mayo described what he planned to do. But essentially the Red Guard went around destroying everything wealthy in China. They killed a lot of their teachers. They killed their wealthier neighbors and generally killed everyone who disagreed with them but created chaos in China. Now to this day now fast forward to 2014, I've talked to some Chinese who say that that generation is looked on as the waste generation. At the time of their lives when they should have been learning a trade, they were going around tearing up, destroying, killing, looting, and rampaging. And then they got older, the Red Guard ceased to be needed or it was very highly frowned on by older and younger people alike. And they found themselves not knowing how to do anything, too late to learn a trade and, in general, left out. Again, that would probably have been me if I had grown up in China. Never bothered to go to school. Possibly killed one, some of my teachers. <laughs> killed the, uh, well, hell yes, they, they did this. Killed every rich neighbor you could find. Destroyed their boss if, if he owned a factory or owned a, destroyed him. And, all did it with the approval of Chairman Mao. Um, the Red Guards, again, your book says they attempt to eradicate four olds. Old thought, old culture, old customs, and old habits. In other words, we're going to do away with the old to bring in the new and bring China into a new. Then it, again, they destroyed temples, religious sculptures, tore down street signs, Replaced them with new ones carrying revolutionary names. And, 
Oh yeah, the red light. You know, the red light means stop. I think all of you know that. Well, they said, no, 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 red is the color of go. So they changed the red light where the red meant go and another color meant stop. Um, so where you go on a red light, again, because they wanted red to simple, be the symbol of people on the move, not a symbol of people stopping. Um, so red would indicate the traffic could move. But they had a lot of accidents and a whole lot of confusion. And I mean, foreigners coming in with the, I mean, they did allow foreigners in and they, and they realized, hey, we've got to be with the 10 tune with the rest of the world. So they finally did what the whole world has done and made red a stoplight again. Um, Otherwise, like I say, a lot of people crashed. But the experiment was soon abandoned. I mean, if our government would decide that red would be go, it would cause hundreds upon thousands of deaths before people might eventually get used to it. Um, but because we've just had red being the color of stop for probably 90 years or more. A lot of people in China didn't like the constant turmoil, and they finally encouraged uh, the um, Red Guard to be reined in. A lot of the young Chinese, again, young men and women my age, I mean, hey, I remember seeing a picture on US News where the Chinese sent a picture to it, and, it showed the young boys and girls, I mean, half of them were girls my age, waving their rifles and smiling real big. It looked, they looked highly enthused, but a lot of their enthusiasm was dampened after a time. Um, a young man, one here in a book says, I thought it was a great idea, and I resented my teachers who controlled and criticized me, and I look forward to a little revenge, but later, he watched as his sister joined the Red Guard group and watched his sister denounce her mother and the rest of her family as rightists. Their home was raided by Red Guards. On the basis of some of the Red Guards raided each other. Um, and uh, you know, to make a long story short, no one was safe. Your book compares it to a reign of terror that reminds us of the French Revolution of the late 1700s where the French Revolution of the reign of terror and killed everyone who seemingly disagreed with the revolution. It's similar to the same thing happened in China. Just uh, killing everybody who disagrees with you, destroying everything that, uh, that you don't like just because you don't like their looks. And um, And also, this Red Guardsman had to watch his, his not only did his sister cussed his, but in effect cussed his mother. The Red Guards came into his home one day and saw that his father had a Western shirt and three Western neckties, or at least, yeah, three neckties. And he was severely whipped for owning three neckties and, a Western, and Western shirts. Books and writings were pulled from the center of the floor and burned right before his eyes. And then the Red Guard helped themselves to his salary and his transistor radio. And back then, owning a transistor radio in China was some big something. I mean, it was like you own, I mean, it, was, it would be like us owning an iPad today or something. Anyway, the Red Guard took that. Um, so essentially, they turned on each other, created a whole lot of chaos, and eventually, they disbanded. Well, in 1976, Mao Zedong died. Died of what's called Lou Gehrig's disease. I mean, the only obvious familiar Lou Gehrig's disease is a paralysis that slowly destroys one's ability to move. And uh, nowhere in the world is there a cure. You know, even to this day, there's no cure. Uh, we do know more about it now than we did then, but uh, not even the United States had any way they could treat him. Eventually, after power struggle, in other words, the communist world had the same problem that the Muslim world has had. They have no way to know who's going to be, succeed when the leader dies. 
So what happens, the leader dies, and he does not appoint a successor. Even if he does, they rebel against him. There is a power struggle, and whoever comes out on top in the power struggle, he becomes the leader. Deng Xiaoping became the leader, and he was to rule until about um, 1997. He brought about Mao's cultural revolution to an end. In order to try to uh, bring some restoration, he captured Mao's wife and three of Mao's closest friends in what they called the Trial of Four, and the Gang of Four, the Gang of Four. <clears throat> and they, uh, they placed them on trial and either sentenced them all to death or long prison terms. Again, Mayo's wife, I believe, received a life sentence. Um, the rest of the world didn't think this was a good way to handle the situation. In effect, folks, they needed a scapegoat. So they laid the blame for all the problems on these four people who'd been close followers of Mayo. You'll be hearing the term scapegoat from time to time. A lot of our presidents have had scapegoats. When, when something goes wrong, you lay the blame on, the per on one person and then banish that person to camp. It actually goes back to biblical times when the uh, Israelis, the Jews, would uh, lay all the blame for all their sins on a scapegoat and then banish that scapegoat from the camp. Uh, and again, maybe it's sometimes necessary because after all, you might say, why did they bear the weight of their own sins? And the answer they give us, none of us can. So they laid all the blame on the scapegoat I mean, all right, I'm going to fast forward to 2014. We had some woman high up in Obama's administration resign last week. They're using her as a scapegoat. Lay all the blame for all that's wrong that went wrong with the health care on her and banish her from the administration. Same thing. Use one person as a scapegoat. Lay all the blame. Um, again, that's what they did. So, um, under... Deng Xiaoping, some kind of order was brought to China. China then was able to move forward and finally begin to industrialize, something they could not do. However, they showed that they were not ready to allow dissent. Now, a very famous incident occurred about the time some of you might have been being born. The year was 1989, the place was Tiananmen Square. Tiananmen Square in Beijing, I mean, like it was, a, that's a central meeting place in all of China. Anyway, a bunch of young people, and just like out of college, most of them have been born in the late uh, 50s. No, actually in the late 60s, been born in the late 60s. Young people about high school and college age got together and demanded rights. And because they were local Chinese, initially the Chinese army would not move against them. So the Chinese government called some troops from Inner Mongolia. And these Inner Mongolians began to execute and shoot and disperse the young people at the end of the square. And it showed the world that, tell you, the Chinese communists are just like Chinese communists have always been, or just like communism always has been everywhere. It cannot tolerate dissent. Um, the students were demanding two things, science and democracy. They demanded an end to corruption, and they demanded that China's aging party leaders resign, of which none of which actually happened. But China began to realize the experiment with communism was not working, and your book has a section called Back to Confucius. All right. I don't recall which one of you it was. I believe it was one of you who pictured China as, hey, this country under communism has become a great superpower. Again, if you don't want to own up to it, I mean, I don't recall which one of you it was, but I think it was when you wrote a paper about how China has become a great superpower under communism. They became a great superpower after they had somewhat modified their communism and gone back to Confucianism. The reason they went back to Confucius is because Confucius thinks it worked better under Confucius than they had under communism. 
So they began to embrace some of the better parts of Confucius, restore some of the old order. Um, and um, there were some things about Confucius that made communism easy to take over, for, that made it pretty easy for communists to take over in China. One of it was Confucius, like communism, demanded obedience to the authority, central control. Um, Confucius required this, the communists did. The Chinese more or less conceded also that Marxism was unrelevant in today's China, but irrelevant in today's China. That when Marx had written the Communist Manifesto back in 1859 or 1860, thereabouts, the world was a different world. Marx did not know anything about jet aircraft or about radio or instant communication. Well, they did have the telegraph, they didn't have the radio. They didn't have the television, didn't have the jet airplane or the uh, things like this. That's, it's made the world today a little bit different than the world that Marx lived in. China began to realize that, hey, we've fallen out of touch with the rest of the people in this region. We want to resume our rightful place. After all, China has throughout history been the middle kingdom. If, you know, they were surrounded north by um, Mongolia, on the northeast by Korea, and then on the east across the sea by Japan, and they want to look on themselves, we're the top dog, and they want to be the top dog once again. So they said, we want to resume our rightful place. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they began to uh, change their ways to try to modernize and to industrialize, and to some extent they industrialized. 